Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. Really excited about this, and this is really for him. He's been begging me. He's like, Dad, what are you gonna do, Kiwi? And I said, Son, I've been bugging Angie for a long time to do Kiwi. <laughs> what can they teach us? And the little spot of Kiwi going from five to fifteen hundred, we can learn so much about genetics, and not only give us a greater understanding. Of Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris. And I'm Angie. Hi, Angie. Hey, how are you? Good. I'm like so... I was just... I know I say this every time. Oh, I'm so excited to do this podcast, which I am. Today, I am like... I was so giddy. I couldn't wait till we started recording. I'm not kidding you. I've been like... Full of energy today because we are covering the kiwi, and I've been wanting to cover this bird ever since I found out I was moving to New Zealand. Yes, you're an honorary kiwi now, so this yes. is right up your alley, and yes. I can tell by the smile on your face how sincere and excited you are, which is awesome. Well, no, and Chris, honestly, I felt like I really learned a lot preparing for this podcast, mm -hmm. learning not only about the kiwi itself, uh, as I was not too familiar with a lot of its history and behavior. But also, I felt like I learned a lot about New Zealand. And mm -hmm. I know that you, since you are living there and have a lot of Kiwi friends, that you are going to be able to give our listeners and our audience uh, what, it's, what it means to be from New Zealand and uh, a, lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of the pride of why they call themselves Kiwis. And I think a, a yeah. portion of it has to do with this cool bird that we're going to be talking about today. It 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 is it's iconic. I mean, it is a national treasure. It is iconic bird of New Zealand. I since I was a little kid, I've known about kiwis. You know, this little obscure flightless bird at the San Diego Zoo. I used to always try to find the kiwi in the exhibit. I never saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that little building. I could see it in my head right now. You walk in the door, and it's supposed to be night because they're nocturnal. We'll get to that. And I never saw it. You can never see it. I didn't see my first kiwi bird until I got here. And it was about, I think it was about six, eight weeks ago. I texted you and I was like, oh my God, we got to do kiwis. I saw my first kiwi. You were really it excited. Was the, the brown kiwi. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there, it was so much bigger. The brown kiwi was so much bigger than I ever thought. Well, absolutely. Just, well, that's what going through the pictures and watching the videos of yeah. them. I'm like, holy, holy cow. This is way bigger than I would have imagined. Yeah. Um, I guess a flightless bird to be, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they're yeah, super no, I, cute. That's what I oh, can't yeah. get over their uh, their feathers, their plumage, their mm -hmm. long beak, their dinosaur like legs. They're kind of they, to mm -hmm. me they remind me of a walking dinosaur, mm -hmm. and they're yeah they're just they're just very very charming, and I can see yes, why it's yes. such a such a national. Uh, symbol for New Zealand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is. It is. And I, and, well, and what I learned, Chris, cause I just mm -hmm. obviously I'm a wannabe bird nerd. But right, there's right. so many birds out there that it's hard for me to obviously focus on all of them. So I learned a whole bunch today about Kiwis or in the past mm -hmm. week or so. And hopefully the listeners will learn a lot too. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm hoping at least that you're going to chime in on their incredible conservation story. Yes, yes, that is where it, I think a lot of the pod today is is more. I mean, yeah, we're focusing on the the kiwi and the kiwi bird, but it's going to be it's so interesting, New Zealand, Angie. It's just it's such a unique biome. You know, we the, the, it's so great because we laugh at our Australia and we love our Aussies, but you know, you go over the Tasman Sea and there's so many things in Australia that will kill you. You know, we, we do the salt water crocs, the great white shark. Well, we know sharks don't attack that often, but you know, all of the crazy snakes they have over there, all the the salty crocs, plus the people and the food. Will oh, kill I you. worked I, with kang. I worked with kangaroos, and they are no yes. joke. Yeah, <laughs> koalas as well. <laughs> you know what? Those marsupials, they they'll, they'll, they'll stare at you to death or whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we well, love our Aussies. Well, I feel. I mean. Are you going to sing the like the New Zealand national anthem? I I can just I can just see your pride swelling up as a kiwi and I feel like you might need to do uh, I that did, for us or something. I did Hey, on Anzac Day I did sing God Save the Queen for the first time. I was so excited. Awesome. <laughs> well, I'm going to I'm going to 
Yeah, that's okay. I uh, I uh, I feel you. I, I I always forget words myself. So, yes. but yeah, I'm gonna hold you to that, buddy. I think one of these days you're gonna yeah. sing that, and I because uh, you're really you're really extra happy about being a uh, an honorary Kiwi today, which is a great thing. Yeah, it's no, it's just been exciting because it's you know I've been making lots of friends. You know, Jesse Golden, a very close friend now who works at the zoo here in Hamilton, and then also you know works around you know volunteering and just last night we were hanging out and i've got a great story talking about him seeing a kiwi last week out in the wild cool but yeah he does a lot of conservation work you know he went out on the boats looking for albatross and some other things he's a big bird nerd by the way big <laughs> huge <laughs> he makes you know he look went to like new a, caledonia like a, like a cool bird person or something because yeah, yeah he's huge i want to be huge. i just i just can't commit yeah but you know hearing about New Zealand conservation and his girlfriend, Bryn. So there's a shout out to Bryn. She's always like, why don't you mention me in the podcast? Well, there you go, Bryn. <laughs> and she's from England. So. Oh, I, you know, I think she's going to love how you mentioned her and then made fun of her accent. And, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't, and if she's from, if she's from England, that was not a very good English accent. I think you can do better. No, no, no. Oh, we had this big discussion last night. No, 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 no. I can't do the English accent. But we had this big discussion about her because Please, she doesn't. Sir, I want some more. She no. That Brid doesn't have that. She's from London. She has oh. this really tiny one. Okay. But what I want the listeners to to remember is this Thursday. I and I'm going to promote this the heck out of this too. And I think this is where a lot of my enthusiasm comes from. Is also after I interviewed Dr. Helen Taylor, and mm -hmm. she's from the University of Otago down in Dunedin. She has done some incredible work with the Kiwi and Kiwi research. And she's from England. Awesome. And so she has a very oh. thick British accent. So it's Thursday, yeah. yeah, Thursday, you're going to get a heavy dose of British accent talking about the little spotted Kiwi, which we're going to tell their incredible story. And the work she's doing is just phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal stuff that is just amazing for conservation. So a lot of good, exciting things to to talk about today, Angie. That's why I'm so just pumped, 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 pumped. So, oh, by the way, and I'm starting to catch myself to certain uh, the American version of the Kiwi accent. Mm -hmm. So my seven year old now is like has the total American Kiwi accent. Cute. Like Kiwis, what they is talk that, and then they. So it's like every the end of every sentence is like a question. So they raise their pitch at the end. And so I'm starting to slip into it a little bit every now and then. I don't know if people are picking it up on the podcast or not. My seven-year-old is total. He's because <laughs> he's in school all day, sure. right? With the Kiwis. So, so he's picking it up and it's pretty funny. And Ashley also is picking it up. The, yeah, New Zealand's really growing on us uh, oh. a lot. And Really excited about this. And this is really for him. He's been begging me. He's like, Dad, what are you going to do, Kiwi? And I said, Son, I've been bugging Angie for a long time to do Kiwi. <laughs> and it just took a while to get the interview lined up with Dr. Taylor. So she's been traveling and finally came back and we were able to do it. Also, like I told Angie, I saw, saw my first Kiwi at the Kiwi Conservation Center here. So that was exciting. Awesome. Well, this one's for Rourke. Thank you for the great suggestion, yeah. Rourke. Yep. Yep, he'll be excited to to listen to this. He loved the snake episode too, by the way, the the rattlesnakes because he loves snakes. Awesome! Yeah, that was a fun one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, and, and then this whole story too for the listeners is we're going to continue the story in in a few weeks. I have another interview with with Theo. So shout out to Theo Van Nort. He did a project in the Antipodes, which is a sub Antarctic island off New Zealand amazing story amazing trip i interviewed him last week uh, because he's been really busy and i have that banked so when we cover a species coming up we're going to release his interview and he's a kiwi he's from or he's from new zealand so uh, you'll get more of the the kiwi accent <laughs> <laughs> yay yeah 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 uh, so angie we're going to ask the listeners to stay tuned because what is the plural of the Kiwi? Yeah. Is it Kiwi or Kiwis? So what is proper? And we will tell there everybody right answer, what is though. proper at the end. This isn't one of those trick ones like yes. we've done in the past. No. There is no. the right answer. Apparently. Yeah. The platypi or platypuses or platypus. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That was tricky. A bunch of platypuses. Yeah. 
<laughs> platypus eye. Who knows? And nobody was right, yeah, right? Exactly. Can, there is, yeah, exactly. There's unfortunately there's not a super correct answer. So I'll no, but the, there okay. is with this. Yeah, there is with this. And then there's so. and there's also and, and so is this just yeah. for the kiwi bird or is this for kiwi the the New Zealanders and kiwi the fruit as well? Yeah. Good. Hey, you're reading my mind because mm-hmm. that was my oh. next thing. Was there is a bunch of different descriptions when you say mm-hmm. kiwi. All right. So first, the kiwi bird is the unofficial national bird and symbol of New Zealand. There's not really a official national bird like, say, the bald eagle okay. of the United States. Right. And it's important to say there's five species of kiwi bird. So there's not just one. There's there's five different ones. And we'll get into the differences. Now, part of New Zealand, the silver fern is our unofficial national plant. So at the Olympics, all of our, at the Winter Olympics, all of our athletes from New Zealand had the silver fern. They had really cool outfits like the black and we all wear black <laughs> down here. I don't know. You know, cause the all blacks, the rugby team. And, but then you had this really cool silver fern. So that's our unofficial national plant because their ferns are everywhere and gorgeous. Now, uh, the kiwi fruit, so there's the kiwi people of New Zealand, then you have the kiwi bird, then you have the kiwi Mm -hmm. fruit, which is proper, what my seven-year-old told me, dad, you don't call them kiwi or kiwis, you call them kiwi fruit. So you have to- Oh, really? Now, I did not know that. Yeah, you have to put the fruit at the end. So, because that way- Oh, because there's other types of kiwis. Yes, yes. (laughs) Ah, see, we don't have that problem. If you, basically, you say kiwi, you're talking about the fruit. Right. In North America. Not here. No, 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 no. Now, Chris, interestingly enough, I remember being eight years old and my parents, uh, and interestingly (laughs) enough, they both had a really bad flu and they were in the hospital- and so we had a neighbor babysitting us and she was like this health nut. Mm-hmm. Cause we grew up on like, we grew up on like Kool-Aid and yeah, you know, blueberries, all sorts yeah. of whatever yeah. and blueberries. Yeah. But she brought us kiwis, the fruit, mm-hmm. kiwi fruit. And my sister and I had never had it. So of course we were you know, little snobs mm-hmm. and we turned our nose mm-hmm. up to it like, ah. mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then we tried it and it's really, really oh, amazing. It's, awesome. it's yeah. a great fruit. Yeah. Kids love it. But I think it was back in the eighties when I was growing up, it was like a new, it was a new right. fruit in North America. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is. And it, it's, it really, so New Zealand took this fruit. It's actually called the Chinese gooseberry. So that's what it is. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they started growing it here and now it's the kiwi fruit. How does it grow? <laughs> does it grow on a tree vines, or a bush? Like, yeah, tree vines. We actually just did a garden tour the other day. So um, my wife works with some of this stuff now that she's working with pollination with the, the honeybee. And I believe it's like their vines, long vines that they grow out and splice out and then grow these these kiwi fruit. It's like kiwi, it's trees, but they, the way they're, they're growing apples and ap, not oranges, but apples here. Like they're doing all sorts of crazy stuff with the branches, like splicing them out so they get more production. It's really cool, actually. So mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. But again, Adam, that's out of my comfort zone. The <laughs> yeah, but anyways, different podcasts for yes. different scientists. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Now the kiwi fruit looks like a little kiwi. It just does. That's where it got its name because it looks like the kiwi. Yeah, fur. brown and furry. I never put yeah. two and two together. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. So which came, the bird came first and then they named the fruit after oh, yeah. the bird? So, yeah, um, I'll jump ahead real quick, just since you're asking that. That's a really good question. The Maori, and that's the other thing in, in New Zealand, they they roll their R's. And I'm starting to pick it up a little bit. So instead of Maori is how I'd say it in America, it's Maori. You roll that R, which is very really hard good. To, good to do. Yeah. yeah, I can't do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they are the native New Zealanders, right? Okay. They named them the Kiwi. Ah. Now, it's controversial where the name came from. Some people think that the Maori heard the the bird call and thought it sounded like Kiwi, Kiwi. And that's where the name came from. Others have said there's a the similar flightless bird on one of the Polynesian islands that's called Kiwi. And so that's where it came from. The funny thing is, like, later on, you're going to play some Kiwi calls. Mm-hmm. It does not sound like Kiwi to me at all, right? Oh, is this? I well, don't hear it. Maybe it's one of these Laurel Yanni type situations. 
Did that's you? what I was saying. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that's what I that's what I came up with. I think Dr. Taylor and I were talking about that. Uh, because I said, you know, is it one of those things that we hear it differently? And she said, oh, it could be. But, you know, she was like, I, and I might have been off air. I don't know if I put it in the recording. But I was asking her about, you know, was it true that the the Maori thought that the Kiwi was, you know, what it sounded like? And she said, yeah, it's still kind of controversial. But anyways. So, just so yeah. On a side note, uh, do you, mm-hmm. did you hear Laurel or Yanni? Laurel. I I'm pretty sure Laurel I heard too, Laurel. Yeah. I mean – yeah like no a no-brainer but john heard yanni yeah so of course we had a door we had a <laughs> dork out and find the yeah. i think it was like a new york times uh or washington post yeah. like did the science behind it and then they had the uh-huh. the monitor where you could move it as far as the decibel pitches high and low so yeah i had to figure it all mm-hmm. i had to figure it out scientifically to, to like understand it and process it but yeah is it because we blew out our eardrums at some point, or <laughs> just, I love? We can't I mean, hear. <laughs> I, I've played a lot of music, been to a lot of loud concerts and bars, and I I didn't start right. putting earplugs in until mm, like my early thirties. So yeah, I'm sure there was yeah. some damage done for sure. Yeah, in my ex-military, I was like firing guns right next to your head. <laughs> oh like, yeah, oh, yikes! Ooh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyways, for the listeners, Laurel and Yanni was a thing. If you don't know what that is, cause I didn't until somebody asked me is it's, it's a, a recording Google. and yeah. And I'll put a link in the show notes. I'll, I'll, I'll try to remember that. And you listen to it and some people hear Laurel and some people hear Yanni. And then each side is like, no, it's Laurel. No, it's Yanni. No, it's Laurel. Yeah. So they go back and forth. Well, it's like it, it, there was the, is the dress blue or black? That was the thing. The, oh, yeah. Two years ago. It's it was one of those. Oh, it was blue. It was totally blue. I don't know what people are talking about. I, or, or white. <laughs> no, it was, it was, what is the dress blue yeah, or black yeah. or white and gold? And yeah. I actually saw both. And it yeah. depends on your computer screen, yeah. and the lights and the angles and yada blada. So. Yeah. 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 It's, it's weird how the brain works. All right. Back to the Kiwi bird. This is a ratite, so this is the class of flightless birds, the ostrich emu, emu cassowary, mm-hmm. and the ray. Mm-hmm. How do you say that? Rhea from South South America. Rhea. And Rhea. Rhea. That's it. Duh. Yeah, Rhea. And these animals don't have flight muscles or an anchor or sternum. You know, like I was thinking about it, I was like, oh, like a turkey when you or a chicken when you you know take mm-hmm. off the breast meat. There's the sternum that kind of goes up in a in a sharp point, these birds don't have that. It's more flat because they don't okay. have flight muscles, right? So they don't ah, need it. Ah, makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then they have little vestibule wings. So like ostriches do mm-hmm. these crazy Cute. displays with their wings. Yeah. yeah. The, the Kiwis now their wings are hidden in their feathers. You can't really see them. So they have, but they have okay. little tiny wings in there. Now, like we said, the Kiwis just looks like a, a ball of feathers, right? I mean, their mm. feathers are crazy. Yeah. They're How would so you describe cute. their feathers? Um, yeah. Long and they look, they don't look like down feathers, but they look like narrow um, and like well, well defined or well characterized. Mm-hmm. And I thought I read somewhere mm-hmm. it's because their their feathers are maybe, um, they're like too branched, but, uh, but fluffy's not the right. right word. Maybe bristly, almost like hair like. Yeah. I, it is hair like and 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 I thought they kind of look fluffy. I don't know. I've seen some videos of them. I'm so surprised. It looks like hair. It yeah, actually looks it really like does. hair. Yeah. Cuz they don't have the hooks, right? So mm-hmm. bird feathers they they hook together for flight. These feathers don't. So it is like a shaggy coat is how they describe yeah. it. Yeah. But they're feathers. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting yeah. and So the Maori oh. Yeah, I was gonna say the Maori they they like prize kiwi bird feathers. It was like a big deal to have like a, a kiwi headdress or, or kiwi coat or something like that. So yeah, they're supposed to be amazing to touch, but you know, it, it, I think it's rare to be able to touch them. Doctor Taylor got to you know lots of videos of that. <laughs> uh, now there's the brown kiwi and there's different species, and then little and great spotted kiwi. So the you you know the brown's kind of your typical iconic kiwi. You know even our yeah, it's like a it's like a dark brown, chocolate brown in color. Right. And then the great spotted or the little spotted have speckles in their coats mm-hmm. or in their feathers, right? Mm-hmm. And and I was thinking like why you know, and they said what their coats were dark because in, in their history they didn't really have any real natural predators, but to hide. And I was like, why would they need to hide? But then I remembered Angie 
I don't know if you remember this, the largest raptor ever. Do you remember? Rack that brain. I know it's late at night there in Michigan. <laughs> it is late at night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ev- like remember? Ever or currently? Like currently ever. Largest raptor. Ever. Yeah, we did that during the Harpy Eagle. I was like, mm, Angie. Yeah. Where did the largest eagle ever live or largest raptor ever live? And it took a while. In, and you're like. In New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yay. It was the Harst Eagle. Huge. But with the. And, and I'm going to talk about the MOA. The MOA was one of the tallest flightless birds ever to live. The The Maori hunted the MOA into extinction. But the Harst Eagle went extinct too because they lost the MOA. And okay. so I was thinking maybe that's why Kiwis needed to hide. I don't know. Predators. Cause oh, they don't were predators back in the day. Yeah. It may be. Yeah. Because they don't really, you know, why aren't they pink or red or something? If they don't really have any, right. you know, like birds of paradise or something. All right. Okay. What's also interesting, Angie, is they have the smallest eye size to body ratio of any bird. Yes. I found that yeah. to be very, very interesting. Um, not only do they have, a very small eye compared to their body size, but also mm-hmm. that their sight is sometimes underdeveloped and blind specimens mm-hmm. have been observed in nature. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they just, because they're nocturnal. So yeah, they're at nighttime they and they don't it. really yeah. need to rely on their sight for survival and foraging. And certain studies have shown that about a third of the population of the Rowie, uh, that's one of the mm-hmm. species or nickname for one of the species of Kiwis, um, has also even had like ocular lesions in one or both eyes. Mm-hmm. And it showed mm-hmm. that some mm-hmm. of them had complete blindness, but yet they were still in outstanding physical health, even though they had these ocular abnormalities. Right. So they don't really depend a lot on their eyesight, but they do depend on their beak, which we're going to get to in a little bit on really what's cool about it. Yeah. Their so beak has, that helps yeah, them. Yeah. Just around. a little tidbit. Yeah. Is there uh their beak, yeah. It's very specialized and they're, they do something yes. cool that most birds yeah. can't do with their beak. Yeah, it's really cool. Now, the the, the five species, they're, they're big and small. So I saw the brown kiwi, which is one of the bigger, but the great spotted kiwi is the biggest and it stands about 18 inches or 45 centimeters. So, you know, okay. it's, it's big, well, bigger than you would have thought. It is. And what I would say just in general, the five species of kiwis, of course, there's some that are larger and some that are smaller, but wouldn't you say just like on average domestic chicken size? Yeah. Is that about yeah, right? The, the, the brown spotted or the brown one I saw, not the brown spotted, I saw the brown kiwi, northern brown ki- kiwi. It, I just was shocked because I was expecting to see this little bird that could fit in the palm of my hand or both my hands. Right. And here I had a bird that I could hold in my arms, not in the palm of my <laughs> hands, right? So a large chicken, I would say, or, you okay. know, yeah, because they weigh on like its, On its pounds. way to a turkey, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in between. I would say in between a chicken and a turkey is the, is okay, the yeah, size I would put it. Yeah. And I wish I could have taken a picture, but it said no pictures, and it was, mm. you know, this night exhibit. I did take yeah. some pictures of the stuffed kiwis they had there, but the actual live kiwi, I couldn't get a video of it. Now the smaller one, the little spotted kiwi stands about 10 inches. That's the one you, I always thought of, you know, and about three pounds or 1.3 kilograms. So small, sure. that's okay. a small, smaller. Mm-hmm. that's like, yeah, that's like a, what a, a very small chicken, small chicken, like a bantam, you know, something like that. So the five species, you ready? I, now, I know born ready for this, Chris. Yeah. And a lot, it, it, the thing is, we, even though there's five species, we're going to focus a little bit more in on the little spotted kiwi because Dr. Taylor's interview, that's her research. And they have, I think, the most interesting story right now in conservation. And so that why that, that interview on Thursday is just great. She was, she was wonderful. Like, you know, oh, she was wonderful. It was, it was a great, great interview. Talk about, you know, developing, <laughs> I know we always say conservation crushes. Just, I can talk to these women all day. Not just anybody. I could, I could go back and talk to Ni- Niaga all day. Like exactly. It just, yeah. Yeah. No, inspiration does not yeah. necessarily inspiration and enthusiasm and passion doesn't no. really pick a gender. You know, it, it is. No, no, it's, no. It's exciting it was, to be around any it, of that for sure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's. It was great. It was a really great interview. So the little spotted kiwi. The species name is Apoteryx oweni. 
Now, it's all of these species are listed as vulnerable. And Dr. Taylor and I get into a little bit about the little spotted because she really thinks they, they should be maybe classified a little bit higher. Mm-hmm. But there are about 1,200 to 1,500 animals. Okay. And we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, their story here in a minute. Now, the giant spotted kiwi or Roroa, mm-hmm. as Angie said, is, is apteryx. I think I said, pasty. I think I said Roe in my Midwestern. Yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah. And I got to roll my R's. It's, it's Roro. I can't do, I can't do the proper, uh, New Zealand pronunciation. The Roroa and the Maori. There, it's a Maori name for Okay, for yes. So it's the Your more, uh, Kiwi friends yeah, traditional can name. totally make fun of me s- slaughtering oh, yeah. all these names. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, one day. One day I'll get there. I've, I've just, uh, you know, just the stuff around here I've started to pronounce appropriately. But uh, they're listed as vulnerable. You just to- ask Rourke. I just ask yeah. Rourke. Rourke will be able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so there's about 20,000 of them left, but their populations are decreasing. Oh, okay. Okay. The little spot spotted, their populations are increasing. Thus, they got, they went from what threatened to vulnerable. The graded spotted kiwi, there's 20,000, but they're decreasing. So then you have the roe or what used to be called the Ocarito brown kiwi. Now they're listed mm-hmm. as vulnerable, but there's only 400 of them left, but populations increasing. So. Right. It's a, uh, it's actually, I, we love to report on mm-hmm. good news stories mm-hmm. in conservation. And this is one of them. Just back, I think it was in De- December of 2017, both the, the Rowie, which of course mm-hmm. we're not pronouncing the correct way, uh, and the Northern Brown, which you'll get to in a second, were downlisted from endangered mm-hmm. to vulnerable by the IUCN, the International okay. Union of Conservation for Nature. So that's pretty exciting. And it just goes to show, which I know we're going to focus on throughout the podcast, mm-hmm. or at least part what I want to focus on is the immense efforts by New Zealand mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. save this bird, the, several of these species of kiwis from extinction. And right. they need uh, all the, between the scientists, the, the communities, the government all came together and they, they, definitely need to get applauded yes. and we'll, we'll focus yes. more on the specifics that they've done that have worked right. very well, but it's awesome, Chris. Yeah, no, it's, that's what makes it's me a, so excited living here. Yeah. It, yeah. It's a real feel good story. I, it's yeah. just incredible what they've done. Yeah. 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 Definitely. And um, yeah, when I get into the history of them here in a second, it's, it's incredible where they've come from. Now the Southern Brown Kiwi or Tokoika, is Apteryx australis. Mm-hmm. It's like Australia. I think somebody from Australia came over and named one of our birds. What the heck? You know, hey, if be, you're a scientist that uh... finds it, just, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so they're listed as vulnerable with 27,000 animals. And then, like Angie said, the, the North Island brown kiwi, that's the one I saw, is there's about 35,000 animals left. Okay. So, so you know, the, the bigger ones, there's quite a few animals. The littler ones are the ones that are that are a little bit in trouble uh, with that. But like you said, the New Zealand government has recognized that. And now, where they range, Angie? Mm-hmm. They these kiwi have ranged in both the North and South Island. So people, you know, that aren't too familiar with New Zealand, there is the North Island that I'm living on, and then we have a a break. It's called the the Cook Strait. Wellington's at the tip of the North Island at the bottom. That's our capital. I'm up near Auckland. Auckland's at, at the northern part of the North Island. So the Shire in Lord of the Rings. That's where they filmed a lot of that. On the north okay. part of the North so Island? The, and uh, No, actually the Shire is like 30 minutes from me. Oh, cool. It's where Hobbiton. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's Mata Mata and it's right down the road from me. So I live in the Shire, you know, from Lord of the Rings, if you want to look at the, uh, the landscape. I'm actually... Like I said, tomorrow I'm going to Mount Doom while we're recording this. <laughs> <laughs> so Te- Teapa is where I'm going, or Taupo, sorry, not Teapa. I'm going to Tapo tomorrow, Tapo, Lake Tapo. It's supposed to be gorgeous. Now, the South Island, okay, so you have the break of the Cook Straits, then you have this whole land mass of the South Island. How far, how long is the Cook Strait? Is there a bridge across it or no? No, so the Cook Strait's only 14 miles or 22 kilometers across. So to get there, you have to take a ferry which hopefully next mm-hmm. spring, summer, because it's winter here, we will be doing. 
to do the drive. Now the South Island, both are beautiful in their own way, different, almost different environments. South Island is more of the rocky terrain, the snowy terrain, the glaciers. That's where uh, in Lord of the Rings, like where the horse people and the mountainous parts were, that's where they filmed a lot of that down there in the South Island. Well, I recently had a friend visit, is it Queenstown? Yeah, that's South Island. Yeah. The landscape was breathtaking. Yes. It is South Island, I believe. And yeah. it, and it I need you to go there <laughs> for me. <laughs> or when I come, that's where we're going. Right. Yeah. So in the, the South Island, you have uh, Christchurch, which is supposed to be gorgeous. Where Jesse was for a long time is Kakura. And I've got to go there. There are a lot of whales off there. They blue whales. He was working with the dolphin mm. sighting tours and stuff. And that's supposed to be really beautiful for ecotourism. And then you're right. Christchurch. Mm -hmm. Then you go down to Queenstown. And then very at the bottom. And that's where Dr. Taylor is, is Dunedin. And that's where the University of Otago is. And when I get to Theo, that's where Theo left when he went to the sub-Antarctic islands out of Dunedin. So, yeah, lots of beautiful places to come visit New Zealand. But the different species of kiwis are isolated on either the north and or the south islands. Yes, yes. And it was, you know, the history of it. Yeah, I was kind of looking at it, the, you know, the evolution, we don't know a lot about it, but you imagine as the, the seas dropped, the islands were connected. And then when the seas rose, the islands got separated. So over time, yeah, and then also Stewart Island, you know, one of the big islands off here, these populations got separated. Now, the Kiwis today, very fragmented ranges and the little spotted Kiwi is actually isolated on islands. And then on the mainland near Wellington, the capital, there is one sanctuary where they're located on like the main North Island. So the little spot of Kiwi, which we're really going to focus on was actually originally on both North and South Island, but now they're just on these refugees. Okay. Refugees, yeah, I'm yeah. looking at my map now and I'm, yeah, I'm seeing how that it is off of the tip of the South mm -hmm. Island, but then off of many islands on right. uh, North Island and really fragmented. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to talk about why that is, because that's part of the, the conservation efforts here with that. So I guess one of the questions is why care about Kiwi? I mean, not only for me, they're a national symbol, you know, the national symbol of New Zealand. Then I'm going to tell you what Dr. Taylor's doing and the little spot of Kiwi going from five to 1500. We can learn so much about genetics and not only give us a greater understanding of genetics and genetic diversity, but for conservation, holy smokes, the work she's doing in inbreeding depression. Wow. Wow. That's why I care. I mean, I, I care for a lot of reasons, but what do you think? Yeah. Well, besides it just being a part of an iconic New Zealand association, right? Uh, I think it's an interesting story as far as evolutionarily speaking, that before the arrival of humans in the 13th century or early, mm -hmm. the only endemic mammals were three species of bats mm -hmm. and birds. Mm -hmm. So to a lesser extent, I mean, well, to lesser extents, of course, maybe some insects, a few reptiles yeah. and other things. But yeah, it's with that being said, a lot of their decline besides habitat loss is due to the introduction of invasive predators. Mm -hmm. And New Zealand's, I'm sure you're going to tell more of the story about what they're doing to try mm -hmm. to kind of undo what's been done and why they're going full throttle. I mean, they, you know, talk about going full steam ahead mm -hmm. with money, lots mm -hmm. of money mm -hmm. and, and input from a lot of different people and agencies uh, to save the, to save the Kiwis. It, it's just really important because they were already there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that, I don't know, for me, that's why I just think it's, it's a really feel good story and we do have a lot to learn from it because like you said, going from five to 1500 can help us navigate other species that are getting down to those mm -hmm. low, lower numbers where some, 
some critics would maybe say, oh, why would you save 12 vaquitas? Or why would you, yeah. you know, what's the point with black-footed ferrets? There's only 30 of them under human care. Just, you know, forget about yeah. it. So, yeah. uh, and of course we didn't, you know, in the United States with the black-footed ferret and the, and the, and the mm -hmm. California condor, we we did what New Zealand's doing with the Kiwis and we saw great benefits. And I think mm -hmm. the Kiwis in modern day are a more current story that we can definitely gar garner some information from. No. And I, it's just, you know, it is controversial. And while you were talking about that, it made me think it's just freaking money. Like who cares when you die, you can't take it with you. And why there are tons of people like me who are willing to, and I, and I you know, with my friend Bryn, she just sent me links to volunteer. So I'm going to do some, start doing some volunteer work around here to help restore habit habitats, plant trees, things like that. And I'm like, if there's people like me out there willing to do this free or pay me to do it, you know, I will do it. And it's just money. Right. You know, yeah, I know there's other yeah. things there's and Dr. Taylor. I, I'm going to save it for the interview, but she gives a good, a good response on why we should save species. You know, and, and, and it surprised awesome. me a little bit. Like she, you know, she's tempered in her response. Whereas I'm like, die hard. We need to save all of these things, you know? <laughs> so it, it made me really think the last few days, you know, and I was really thinking about it. And I'm like, yeah, she's right. But I disagree a little bit. And I think we should save, you know, a lot of these animals. Anyways, the, the, the thing is, it's just money. It's worth the effort. And extinction is forever. You know, extinction is forever. Yeah, exactly. This, this de-extinction thing is nonsense. It's, it's not, it's not viable. It is absolutely not viable. And we need to support people like Dr. Taylor because what she's doing is going to be critical, critical to the health of these, uh, you know, low number populations. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's the take home message. Extinction is yeah. forever. At, but recovering species, recovering mm -hmm. numbers is doable. Yeah. It is yeah. definitely oh, yeah. doable. Yeah. It's just it it yeah. does. It takes effort and teamwork and and when we have a model that's actually working like the kiwi mm -hmm. or the black footed ferret, mm -hmm. we just need to around. all yeah. learn from that and yeah. and keep putting those uh protocols into place. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So a little bit more in the history lesson, Angie. This is why I think I was excited too. <laughs> So, like you said, New Zealand was discovered by the Polynesians, and they settled around 1280 in the Common Era. I have a feeling this is so, going to be a long history lesson. <laughs> no, 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 no. But it, it does lead into the history of the Kiwi. So they settled, and then they evolved into the, the Maori culture that it is today. And it's a big part of New Zealand. Like, it is a big part. The government, everybody. The the Maori, it's it's... You come to New Zealand, you have to learn about the Maori. And a lot of our names are Maori names. So they're hard to get <laughs> initially, but you know, it, it's part of being uh, in New Zealand. Now, the little spot of Kiwi's Maori name is Kiwi Puku Puku. Cute. <laughs> so I love that. Pretty cute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So Dutch explorers. So now here comes the Europeans th 300 years later, 350 years later. Dutch explorers first discovered New Zealand in 1642. James Cook circumnavigated New Zealand, the both islands, in 1769. He, he also so didn't he Strait also find named. Hawaii, or is he part of that? Yeah, he did, but also Australia. Okay. Yeah, so Australia, he was a big part of that. Now, in 1840, Brit Britain and the Maori signed the Treaty of Waitangi. Waitangi Day is like a big holiday here. It's like the Fourth of July mm -hmm. in the United States. It's like a big celebration here. And that treaty gave the Maori people full rights as British awesome. citizens. Mm -hmm. But with some cultural differences and obviously exploitation uh, led to some colonial wars with the Maori in the 1860s and 1870s. There's still some bitterness 130, 40 years later between some of the European and the Maori, but it's still a big, it's a huge mm -hmm. part of New Zealand. Like it's, you come to New Zealand, you better, you know, want to learn about them. And, and the Maori are, are awesome. Like when you say, I want to learn more about your culture, they're like, oh God, cool. okay, where do we start? Mm -hmm. You know, and my neighbors are all Maori and I, I love them. They're, they're wonderful. So how did this affect the Kiwi? Okay. Cause it did have that story, that brief, brief history of New Zealand had a big effect. When the Maori came or the Polynesians came, Obviously, they had a huge effect on 
the, the native wildlife. I mean, no human, no primate. Here come these mammals with some dogs and some cats and some islands. rats. Yeah, I don't know if they brought in the rats, but and I don't even know if they brought the cats okay. yet. They might have, but I know they. I, I read they did bring some dogs in, right? But the Maori, they they did hunt, right? And they did hunt kiwi, but really the ones is they had the moa. So the moa was this twelve foot tall, huge, huge tall bird, flightless bird. So like okay, weighed only about five hundred pounds, bigger than an ostrich. Yes, bigger, bigger than an ostrich. Yeah, okay. yeah, much larger. But again, another flightless bird, and that's where the hoss eagle would hunt them. Mm -hmm. And so the Maori hunted them into extinction, and and almost went to extinct in like the 1450s. Now, what I do remember reading at some point is the Maori realized, oh no, this is wrong, and they actually became better stewards of the environment. Mm -hmm. Like they said, okay, you know, we we overhunted these birds. Now they're gone. We depended on them. So we have to become better stewards of the environment. Now they tre like I said, they treasure the kiwi. They call it Taonanga. I'm saying that right? Taonanga? Taonga. Taonga. That's how you say it. T A O N G A. Taonga. Meaning treasure. Oh, wonderful. So yeah. very important yeah. to them too. All right. So obviously I'm sure kiwi populations had some decline there. We don't know. But uh, it, it just, you know, yeah, they were farming, had some habitat destruction with the Maori. There probably was some Kiwi decline, but the big decline, like you said, didn't come till Europeans came. And that was the introduction of mice, rats, stoats, which is like a weasel, then weasels, dogs, brush tail possums from Australia. They brought them in, cats, and then some other stuff that like Theo, it, what Theo's project was, was amazing that we're going to cover in a couple weeks, you know, about some of this predator control stuff, but they devastated Kiwi populations. So... Right now, they're still having a huge effect. It's about estimated 27 kiwi are killed per week by wow. these predators, mm. so 1,400 per year. Yeah, it's unsustainable. We can't mm -hmm. sustain it. You know, the, the kiwi, the mainland kiwis will go extinct. So, like Angie said, there's some really, really cool projects uh, coming that we're going to talk about here later in, later in the pod, you know, in, in about 10 minutes. Now, like I said, evolution, don't know a lot about it. You know, they all come from a, a, a flightless ancestor about 50 million years ago. The, the the oldest fossil they have of any kiwi dates back about a million years ago, a femur leg bone they found here in the North Island. It's don't know a lot about it. Uh, and then just really quickly, because we got so much to cover. The moa was the tallest flightless bird. So 12 feet. 3.6 meters, about 600 pounds or 270 kilograms. Wow. That's huge. Yeah. So where do you think the largest flightless bird lived? Not New Zealand, but... Australia? Yeah, Australia. Okay, where everything will kill you, right? <laughs> yeah, Australia. So it was the Dromornis stood about 10 feet tall, so not quite as tall as the moa, but it weighed... <laughs> Like 650 kilograms or 1,400 pounds, like a horse. It's that one with like the big beak, you know, like the dinosaur head looking beak. Oh, my word. That's just, yeah, they're scary That's looking. like a horse, a big, big horse. Yes, yes. And they died out about 30,000 years ago. So luckily the Aussies don't have to deal with that on top of everything else. So with the Kiwi, you know, individual birds, they live anywhere from 25 to 50 years, maybe even longer. So they're long living wow, animals. Wow, definitely, they're, yeah. They're not, Especially for birds. Yeah. 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 And so they're nocturnal. So during the day, they're usually sleeping in dens. Now I did read, like in some of these islands, they, they do see them active during the day. So they wonder if they've kind of adapted this nocturnal, like exclusively nocturnal behavior due to human activity. Sure. So. Which makes some sense. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, you know, uh, doing that. Now what's also interesting about their physiology, their bones are thick. Filled with marrow, not hollow like a flighty, like a bird that flies. Yes, I'm like Isn't smiling big as you're talking because yeah. I read that yeah. and that is was just really blew my mind. I I took yeah. a lot of I took bird biology years ago and we were always taught adaptation. Birds have hollow bones; it helps them fly, minimizes mm -hmm. the weight, and obviously it makes sense. Kiwis or flightless birds don't need that adaptation. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're they're they have marrow similar to yeah. uh, mammals, other mammals. Mammals, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, they're just like, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. Biology. It's amazing. It's amazing. Now, you did say the beak. Yes. So yes. talk about they that have beak. A very, yeah. Uh, why? It's it's so awesome. They Well, the kiwi in general has a very highly developed sense of smell, which is mm-hmm. unusual in a bird. And the kiwi is the only bird with the nostrils at the end of their long beaks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's bizarre. It's, it's, it's just really totally bizarre. backwards, right? Like if you think of a you know a duck bill or anything with a beak, mm-hmm. the nostrils are always close to where the, the eyes, the beak I guess. or the bill, yeah. yeah, meets the face. And this one, yeah. and Crystal put some pictures uh, on the show notes, and he can maybe zoom in, and you can see <laughs> it. Just you can see that it, I almost. I mean, they must they use it for hunting, right? I, I mean, I have to. Yeah, they do. Assume they do. That. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So they. Their, their hunting behavior. So they also have sensory pits. I, I read this. There's a study that, uh, recently, recent study that they have these little sensory pits to help detect movement. Okay. Cause they used to think they, they would hunt just by smell, but now they think it's also, uh, not the auditory and also vibrotactile. Yeah. Or vibrations. Yeah. Okay. Smell yeah, and vibrotactile. Yeah. Okay. Vi- vibrations. Yeah. yeah. So if you think of like a sandpiper, I think most people know that, like a shorebird, the, the sandpiper, I don't know. I grew up in the ocean. Right, with a long beak yeah. and they, mm-hmm. So they, they go and they, they push it in the ground to sense their prey, right? They're looking for sand, little crabs and stuff in, in the in the sand. So the kiwi goes around and it's tap, tap, tap as it walks, probing the soil. Then once it, this is hilarious. I read this and I was like, oh my God, this is so, I got to see this. It's so cute. <laughs> Once they find what they're looking for, which is usually worms, I mean, they invertebrates and, and other things, sometimes eat fruit. Grubs. Yeah. yeah. Small mm-hmm. fish, crayfish. Sometimes they eat. Amphibians. But, sure. Yeah. They, they tap it. They find what they're looking for and they will drive that beak into the ground to get at it. Sometimes they have to do like a headstand to get it and they'll be kicking their legs. What? Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. I was like, no way. Oh, we've got to find a video of that. That's amazing. I, will, I know. I will look for it. I didn't see it. but So do they, they don't like stab at it. They just do the headstand and reach it, I guess? Sometimes, yeah. Like if it's deep enough, they will push their, their beaks in. And then they use it like a lever. So they'll work it back and forth to widen the hole. And And how they work with worms is they'll grab the worm and pull it out very slowly or relax until the worm relaxes and they can pull it out to mm-hmm. eat it. Right. But ah. if it's deep enough, they'll do a headstand and then kick their little, their legs to like get deeper. <laughs> I just see this little bird doing it's that. It's just like the best visual I've had in a long time. <laughs> I know, I so know. Cute. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> They're like the yoga bird flightless hunters yeah. of New Zealand. Yes, yes, they are, and they're supposed to be. There's loud little suckers like. They say you can hear them. Like I know the the calls are really loud, which you're going to play here in a minute. But if you listen, you can hear them snorting and sniffing because they have all that dirt in their beaks. And so they're clearing it. Ah, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which is, wait, Angie, it's, that's why everybody has to get down here if you don't live in New Zealand. What amazing, like I told you this, we told this in another pod. It is so quiet. Like when we're out in nature doing our hikes, it's really quiet. So I really want to, I mean, I'm going to do night hikes when it gets here a little bit warmer. And listen to the night sounds but it is so quiet through these forests around here like i said you go to florida and it's like <laughs> you know static on a stereo you come a here beautiful and when you hear... insect and frog noises few invasive species <laughs> yes it is so loud it is a stereo which isn't a bad thing but when i'm walking around new zealand and then i hear a bird it's an individual bird and i can hear it and i'll figure out what direction it's in and yeah it's just weird it's well it's you'll have it's to take great. your bird nerd friends out at nighttime and see if you can maybe take some audio of the kiwi vocalizations what when you get there i got a good story i got a good story that jesse told me last night <laughs> okay all right so real quick kiwis have gizzards so they do have stones in there that help them digest some of their food the what are their favorite foods angie this one this one really surprised me it not didn't surprise me native worms can you guess how big they are if Ooh. do you know the biggest worm um like in your mind what's the biggest a worm could ever get 
Well, I recently went fishing, and yeah. usually John does. Mm-hmm. I mean, not to be stereotypical, but he usually does yeah. all that stuff. Uh, I'll put the worm yeah, on the hook yeah. for the boys and all that because I'm just kind of not. Yeah. I'm not. And I'm not really into it. Yeah. But he had to go back home to Florida to work because somebody has to work in our family, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. that's what and I so, said. <laughs> so I went fishing with the boys with a girlfriend, and we. We got there and the poles were all, I had to like, I had to figure out YouTube video, how to like reset the hooks yeah. and the baits and the bobbers. We, <laughs> we skipped the bobbers because I was like, that is way too advanced for this, what we're doing. We're, we're fishing with like oh four, five, yeah. six, seven year olds and a two year old. So, yeah. but long story short, we get it all set and then I had to put the worms on. And Chris, these worms, mm-hmm. my girlfriend even said, she's like, are these worms from Madagascar? <laughs> they were huge. They were probably like... <laughs> I don't. I night, mean, I, crawlers, six yeah. eight inches, which for an earthworm, I thought yeah, was yeah, fat right? and so, juicy. I mean, they, I mean, they must be growing them large or something. Yeah. yeah and yeah. so yeah, so we did it, yeah. and I felt I felt really empowered because I'm just not a fisher woman, uh, even though it's in my family. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think the toughest part was these giant worms. So, yeah. what kind of worms are they hunting for in New Zealand? Okay. Yeah, when when you come down here, we'll we'll have to go look for some of these. So. It's, hold on to the seat, Angie. They get up to two and a half feet long. Okay, I'm putting on my seatbelt. <laughs> yeah. Two and okay. a half feet. Two and a half feet. What? So yeah. Oh, sorry, I just yelled in the microphone. Yeah, you can edit that out. Two and a half feet, Chris. Yeah, seventy-five centimeters or three quarters of a meter. Yeah, they're huge. That doesn't make any sense. I know. I didn't realize it either. But they get these huge worms that are super long. Two and a half feet. These are earthworms. <laughs> yes. The kiwi oh, lava pot on that. Oh yeah, Actually, I got to oh, put a picture I, on the show notes. I got to put a picture of that. Show notes of the. I'm making because, my notes. Like yeah. I said, I had to tell that whole long fishing story because yeah. a six inch worm, six to eight inch worm, was enough to make me run back to the car. Yeah, and, yes. and Get John, <laughs> fly, fly John back to Michigan <laughs> to help me, me and Tristy go fishing. But we didn't. We figured it out. We worked it out. Uh, but. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so when you come here, uh, we'll make you walk the, around barefoot and like all the rest of the kiwis. Yeah. No. But do the <laughs> do the kiwi birds? Yeah, they, they love the worms. These, they look. They're yeah. They're hunting they, these well, footers. Yeah. I mean, we have native worms. I'm sure they eat these ones too. Yeah. Well, so maybe, maybe that's like what they're doing. The, maybe that's what worm. they're doing. The headstand with like they seriously need to do the <laughs> headstand to, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to figure out yeah. how to eat a two foot worm. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I was like, "Wow, I didn't know that." There's, a, I'm like, like I said, every week I learn something new. About I don't New think Zealand. many people know that. So if you stuck with us pod Mm-mm. this long, awesome! Congratulations, yeah. your yeah. your mind is just blown <laughs> too. But I want to see pictures, yeah. so put pictures up. <laughs> I will. I will. All right. So, what are some of the vocalizations? I know you said you had some for us. Yes. Oh my goodness. Uh, let me find it. Oh, I guess I should tell you my story first, and then you can play the vocalizations. Sure. Or do you want to? Yeah, that's great. Cause I don't even okay. Know where so last night we had Jesse over and his parents just came uh, from the States and my wife's parents are here right now from the States, you know, shout out to Texas for us. And then shout out to Jesse's parents of West Virginia. So Jesse was out with his dad uh, up in the peninsula here in, in the North Island and they were looking for Kiwi and he was playing a female mating call on his phone. And he kept long story short, this, the, Cause they heard this mail. So that's, so they heard this mail call cause they're really loud. And just going to play it for a second. And so he played a female. And so the mail kept calling and coming closer and closer and closer. Now, again, we don't have snakes here. We don't have you know, crazy predators. So, you know, you're not going to be scared to death. We just have huge worms. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> yeah. What you don't have in large predators, you make up for in worms for sure. Yeah. But if I'm in the, you know, if I'm in the Everglades and I hear some of the stuff in the bushes, I would be a little nervous. Here in New Zealand, it was fine. So he heard heard this rustling, and the and the the male kept coming near him. So he saw it run across the trail. The the brown kiwi, north northern brown kiwi. His dad kept missing it, and he kept like moving his dad around. But finally, he had his dad like stand still, and he's playing this female call in his phone. And finally, that the the kiwi came up to him, and then was like, "Hey, what's going on? Who are you? You know, you don't look like a female." <laughs> and stuff. So what do you have uh, for vocalizations? Well, in in general, the male kiwi, it, it has like a repetitive shrill that is around 8 to 25 notes mm-hmm. long, whereas the female's call is a little bit 
more guttural, although repetitive, mm-hmm. at 10 to 20 notes. Okay, okay. Here is the female brown. And to compare that to the male, which Jesse was uh, trying to entice, here's the male brown kiwi. <laughs> it, kind of my, it sounds like a dinosaur it's, i know so if you're out in the woods in new zealand and you hear that you're like if i heard that in florida i think i would be freaking out because i'm like what yeah, is I dying think, i think i would take my two foot worms and go the other way yeah. <laughs> now if i hear that in new zealand i'm like oh awesome it's a kiwi but yeah, there's nothing here in New Zealand that's going to hurt you, really. So, it, you know, it's it's such a cool sound. I didn't hear kiwi, kiwi in that one. No, did you? and they, and and they have they have many. Obviously, there's many different, different calls, yeah. types of calls. Yeah. Um, here's an example of another kiwi call. I think it's I think it's male, but see if you can hear kiwi in it. I hear Yanni. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> Just yeah. kidding. Yeah, so their 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 behavior, you know, still learning a lot about it, but the reproduction is incredible. It really is. Today I get to talk about reproduction and behavior in love. Uh true true mm-hmm. love. I would say we have a, both a super mom and a super dad of the bird world, so that's fun to share. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. to back up the bus a little bit, with kiwis once they're bonded a male and female kiwi will tend to live their entire lives as a monogamous couple so mm-hmm. i respect yeah that. yeah yeah that's very isn't that's that a, crazy it is. like, like in birds and you it's said such an amazing behavior yeah you said like 20 to 50 years so yeah i think that that's really awesome and then mm-hmm. so during a mating season the pair will call to each other at night and then they meet in the nesting burrow every few days. And what's super fascinating is once they meet in their nest and they breed, interestingly enough, uh, which is really unusual for female birds. And, and what's super unusual about the female is that she has two functioning ovaries. Which, of course, is normal in a mammal. In most birds and in platypuses, the right ovary never matures. I don't know why platypuses is – I know we've mentioned that when we covered platypuses, platypi, platypods. (laughs) (laughs) But with birds, they usually typically only have the Mm -hmm. one functioning ovary, but the the female of the kiwi has both. Mm-hmm. That just sets her apart. That's kind of a little ab- abnormality that I, I learned about. And since I'm a repro junkie, I thought that was fascinating. And I, mm-hmm. of course, mm-hmm. went down a rabbit hole of why, but researchers don't know. And anyway, so we'll we'll yeah. save that for a different rainy day. Yeah. What is interesting, though, Chris, is that typically the mom, the female, Kiwi, she is only going to lay one egg per season. And the egg will incubate, of course, inside her for Mm -hmm. up to 30 days before she lays it and then it needs to be incubated further like a typical chicken right Mm -hmm. however kiwi eggs so this the female typically over one egg can weigh up to one quarter 25 percent of the weight of that female i know they're huge in fact chris i this is so (laughs) fascinated like when i started reading about this the the kiwi you're an iconic bird there in New Zealand, yeah. it lays the biggest egg in proportion to its size than any mm-hmm. bird in the world. In the world. Yeah. In the world. It's insane. So it's like it takes up like their whole yes, inside. Yes, it's yes. Crazy. So to give a visual on it, because I'm a very visual learner, if you yeah. think of a domestic yeah. chicken, okay, and how, the size of egg that it lays, the kiwi's mm-hmm. eggs Let's just say the kiwi is about the same size as a domestic chicken. The kiwi's egg is six times that of the chicken egg. Six times. 
Yeah, it's crazy. And so needless to say that producing of this huge one egg uh, per breeding season pr- places significant physiological stress on the female for the 30 days that she's growing inside her body. And this is where she's a mm-hmm. super mom, okay? She must eat up to three or four times the normal amount of food to make this egg, this ginormous, crazy egg grow in her body. However, mm-hmm. it's so darn big, this egg, like the last couple of days, like it's just a quarter of the size of her body, if you can even imagine, that there's literally no space left for her stomach. And she's forced to fast and not eat the last few days while she's growing that egg. Now, for mm-hmm. any of you fellow moms out there or husbands out there that have had a wife that's been pregnant before, <laughs> if you're going to tell me I would have to fast the last couple of days I was pregnant, I would probably yeah. punch yeah. you in the face. <laughs> Let's just be honest, okay? <laughs> so this super kiwi mom sacrifices her body – like a large portion of her body to grow this egg. And then she doesn't have to eat. And mm-hmm. you know what, Chris, I'm going to tell an Ashley story for you. Your, uh, your wife was so funny. Okay. Okay. With Rourke, she told me the story with Rourke when she was in pregnant and then in labor, she knew she was in labor and it's con- it is known that when you're in a woman and you go into labor, it might be, especially with your first, it might be 24, 36, mm-hmm. 48 hours. The first one usually takes a little longer. And they, a lot of mm-hmm, hospitals mm-hmm. encourage you not to eat because it's just not going to go over well. And in case they need to, in case they did need to do surgery on you or something, they don't want you to eat. Well, your mm-hmm. wife, Ashley, being the little firecracker that she is, bless her pumpkin heart. I love, I love her yeah, and her, yeah. um, more than she'll <laughs> ever know, but she was going to teach that hospital yeah. a lesson. So the minute that she realized she was in labor and needed to go to the hospital, she stopped. I think she made you stop and she got a bagel. Yeah. She yeah. was like, I'm going to eat because I know that I'm about to go through a long process of trying to birth out this ginormous baby. <laughs> and so she did eat. And then she said uh, about five or six hours, four or five. I don't know exactly sure how many hours when she was in hardcore labor that uh, the bagel came back up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> which yep. is why which which is why the doctors don't typically don't let or encourage you i think they will let you eat but they encourage you not to eat because it often comes back up but anyways so ashley was going to teach the hospital lesson ironically enough it they were right um but so it's one thing to not eat a few hours before you go into labor or during active labor but yes yes, yes. a super mom kiwi stops eating for like three days before because she can't before she lays this egg. Super mom. Then then her lifelong monogamous 20-year partner comes in. She lays the egg, this ginormous egg compared to her body size. And super dad kiwi Mm -hmm. comes in and incubates the egg, which means he he lays on it uh, for up to 63 to 92 days, depending on the, um, depending on, of course, the individual species. However, with the great spotted kiwi, both parents will incubate. So, but for the rest of them, it's all on dad, super dad. Mm -hmm. And I just find that very, I just found that very fascinating the way that they, what is it about, Birds south of the equator, like, cause that's the penguin story too, right? Like, I, I don't the know. March penguins. of the penguins, I, yeah, yeah. No, I'm actually hanging out with my penguin uh, best zookeeper okay. buddy in a couple days here, and so okay. I will ask Andy. I'm going to try to get him on the air to do a penguin interview. Uh, he has okay. raised a lot at the zoo where he works. So, but I, I do think mm-hmm. you're right. I think there's something with that. There must be. Yeah, yeah. March of the penguins. Like, if you ever watched that movie. It's the the males and females switch off. So and then they march like all the way to the ocean, and I, I can't remember how far it is, but it's far. Oh, I do. And okay, go I, I, feed, uh-huh. and then weeks later come back and march inland, and then they switch off. Okay, and then like they feed their chicks. What? Yeah, and then and they're monogamous yeah. too. Yeah. So well, we're, we're definitely know, they, penguins yeah. in our radar for this fall for sure. Uh, yeah. But well. 
these Kiwis are even, there is no, except for, mm-hmm. for the great spotted, there is no switching off. It's all on dad. And I, yeah. and I need to find some more hey. scientific papers. Yeah. And I, I would like to learn more about that, about <laughs> the pros and the cons and how, how do they eat? Does the, does the, the wife or the mom, not the wife, <laughs> sorry. Does the female yeah. feed them? <laughs> oh, yeah. I have my little, like, I have my little, it like, bird wife. family <laughs> visual going on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is something about New Zealand because that's what's going on now. You know, my wife's out there working hard. Yeah, and, uh, you're like incubating on the, the egg right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not pregnant, Angie. I'm not pregnant. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's really cool. It's really cool. And so, Chris, we have this super mom and this super dad, and they come together and they both have these really incredible roles for um, gestating and then incubating the egg. And then these mm-hmm. eggs are hatched. And what is probably maybe not as well known for many people, at least it was news to me. And it's, it's a sadder story, but I think uh, knowledge is power. And the more we learn about species, the better we can help them survive. So studies in New Zealand show that nationwide, only about five to 10% of Kiwi chicks survive to adulthood without management. Yep. It's, it's dire. I mean, it's dire on the mainland. It's dire. So obviously due to pred- predation uh, from these invasive predators. So, yeah. you know, that's, gosh, a lot of, so much work and time goes into with these parents. And obviously mm-hmm. for me to anthropomorphize a lot of love and care, uh, yeah. and then yeah. they're not yeah. getting a lot of gain back because a lot of their offspring are not surviving. Well, and so no, that that's a great segue into the conservation story that's going on right now. Here. Right. Mm-hmm. So to, to give you perspective, right. So we talked a lot about, you know, the, the human settlement, the, the five species all in decline, except that the two little ones are increasing. So that's good. Mm-hmm. That's but, right. That's great news. Absolutely. Right, right. But the, the bigger species are all in decline. The department of conservation is huge here in New Zealand. And with our awesome, Prime Minister Jacinda. She just had her baby like a month ago. P.S. Yeah. Love her. Super progressive. Yeah. Uh, yes. I've been I've been following her, some of her um uh, her pictures and mm-hmm. uh yeah, she's just she's getting yeah. it done. It's awesome. Yeah, she's amazing. And it's funny because like New Zealand, less than five five million people. One of the people, friends, James, I don't know if James listens to the podcast or not, but uh, he's, he's amazing. His family's amazing. His wife's Canadian. So, uh, great, great friends. He actually knows her really well and they're her family, you know, cause he's, it's oh, a small, cool. you know, it's a small town in New Zealand. Yeah. It's a small town, <laughs> the go. whole thing. But with her, the likes of her government, they've even poured more money into the Department of Conservation. Yeah. Chris, I was reading that, um, each year New Zealand commit over $2 million a year on how to best manage the Kiwi and control the impact of predators. So the for big just the thing, Kiwi, it, $2 million for just a Kiwi. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And like I said, uh, shout out to Bryn, uh, our friend, and Jesse, who do a lot of this work too. So New Zealand has this initiative called Predator Free New Zealand in 2050. It's a little bit controversial, mm-hmm. but they are working to get rid of invasive species to save native wildlife. Now, they're only... F- focusing and dr taylor and i kind of go into this a little bit on thursday so i won't get too much into it yeah don't spoil all the beans no 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 but so what they've done is the the strategy right now is they've gone to these small islands off new zealand and cleared them of predators right gone and worked and, and got rid of them and they've established these like so when you look at the range map which i'm going to post on the show notes of the little spotted kiwi they're on all these little islands because they've moved that population and spread them out so they can, Uh, they can work and and survive. Now talking to Dr. Taylor, they're at capacity pretty much or almost there is Zealandia, which I've included a link in the show notes, which is right outside Wellington, the capital, which is a predator free area with predator proof fencing around it. So there's little spotted Kiwi inside there and a lot of native birds. Cute. So Dr. Taylor is, talks about this is Zealandia. Yeah, outside Wellington. I think that's a great so, band name. <laughs> it is, it is, it is. And I gotta get down to Wellington and I'm definitely gonna go. And she said, like you go out at night and they have really great walks and you can see the Kiwi oh, yay. Uh, at night. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. And it's kind of like ecotourism. 
So you got to pay a little bit to get in there. But predator-proof fencing awesome. and a lot of native wildlife within it. So the really what they're doing is working hard to get rid of these predators on throughout New Zealand. How successful we'll be, we'll see. You know, the goal is in the next 30 years to clear off or clear out as many of these introduced invasive species as possible to preserve uh, native wildlife. I mean, we have a big tree disease that's going through right now. I mean, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of challenges uh, with that. But I'm going to put the links on there. So if you want to read more about this, Dr. Taylor and I talk a little bit about it. Well, and Chris, I was reading about a program, uh, I believe it's run by the government called Operation Nest Egg. And that's where kiwi eggs and chicks are removed from the mm -hmm. wild and hatch or reared under human care until they're big enough to fend for themselves, which is usually when they weigh around 1,200 grams or 42 ounces, which is big enough to basically avoid common predators. They're then returned to the mm -hmm. wild. Mm -hmm. And when Operation Nest Egg does this program, the bird has a 65 percent chance of surviving to adulthood compared to just the 5% for wild hatch and raised chicks. And this is one of the tools that they use to really help increase uh, the numbers of the mm -hmm. little spotted mm -hmm. kiwi. Yeah, no, it's, there's a lot of initiatives and, and some of the organizations, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah and I, yo, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, conservation organizations I selected this mm -hmm. week is called Kiwis for Yay! Kiwi. And they can be, <laughs> Yeah, Yay! Yeah, it's awesome. And so they can be found at www.kiwis4kiwi.org. And so that's K I W I S F O R K I W I dot org. Mm -hmm. And they have a great presence on Facebook. So Kiwis for Kiwi, just a search for it on Facebook, or we'll put some the link in mm -hmm. the show notes. But their mission is to enable the kiwi bird to flourish in their natural habitat forever. And they do this by supporting conservation projects with money and funding. They uh, provide access to expert scientific knowledge, training, and education. And, of course, their goal is to ignite the passion for all New Zealanders to join into this fight to save the national icon. Mm -hmm. And that's how you become a Kiwis for Kiwi, yep, right? Yep. And the group is also really well known for supporting community-led Maori. Is that how you say Maori. It? Maori. You got to roll that Maori. R. It's tough. It's tough. Maori. It, it, Maori? Now that's French. Maori. It's Maori. It's <laughs> now you got me doing the French. It's Maori. It's 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 really Maori. yeah. It's I'm and I'm probably not even pronouncing it 100 percent correct. I just instead of Maori. I think how, this that's med, I. Yeah, I think this Midwestern <laughs> girl is just gonna have to say Maori. Yeah, it's <laughs> Maori. not. It's not Maori. <laughs> But they, but anyways, they yeah. they lead a lot of community uh, community support programs to basically take the kiwi from endangered to everywhere, which mm -hmm. is awesome. And their website is filled with beautiful f photos, every fact you could ever want to know about kiwis, which is where I was learning a lot about them in preparation for this podcast. The group does research, they do habitat protection, they provide many programs. And some of the cool programs to touch on really quick is they have uh, get your dog trained to avoid Kiwis and they have a list of trainers in the area. They'll actually work with your dog to basically not hunt down Kiwis to avoid them. They work on building predator proof fencing, which Chris had already talked about. And they work, I believe, with this Operation Nest Egg or a program similar to that where they'll take precious eggs and chicks from the wild nurture them, and then uh, relocate them when they're larger. And they also work really closely with the Department of Conservation, the government, to meet the goals set out by the National Kiwi Recovery Plan. And one of my favorite things about their website, and I think this is going to be helpful to your audience in, mm -hmm. in New Zealand, is they have a lot of ways for the public to take actions and tons mm -hmm. and tons of resources on the website. So Chris, oh, put yeah. on the show oh, notes, yeah. Kiwis for Kiwis, they've got volunteer shopping, fundraising ideas. But then for the individual person, whether you're a farmer, a pet owner, um, a bird nerd, a school owner, or you have forest or land, they have different tips to help you 
save the Kiwi and what you can do it depending on the type of individual you are. So I, I just really appreciate that because it's, it's very useful for not only somebody just wanting to learn more about Kiwis and understand them overseas, but also for the local people. So yeah, if you follow them on Facebook, they're going to keep you up with all the latest news and what's going on. And then you get to see the videos and sightings and just learn more about the Kiwis and hopefully fall in love with these little brown looking fluff balls, flightless birds yeah. that uh, <laughs> I I know that I've fallen in love with. And obviously Chris is like a total bird nerd for. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, I reached out to them and yeah, you know, for an interview and they, they put me in contact with Dr. Taylor. So awesome. shout out to Paul. For, okay. So for yeah, that our all. listeners. Yeah. yeah. When they, when they look for that interview yeah. in a couple of days, uh, you, you'll yeah. probably learn more about Kiwis for Kiwis. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, just the work that they do and support. So yeah, it's, it's great. It's great. Yep. And for my second organization I selected this week, uh, I want to focus in on the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, which is mm -hmm. pretty ubiquitous well <laughs> and well known uh, yeah. in most countries. But I was really pleasantly surprised to find about the World Wildlife Fund of New Zealand. And they can be found, of course, at www. They, or they can be found at www.wwf.org.nz for New Zealand, of course. No, it's NZ. And, Sorry, what? It's Z. It's Z. Everywhere on Earth doesn't say Z; they say Z. Oh, so, yeah. It's American. Okay. It's Z. In England, proper English, it's Z. So you go through the whole alphabet A B C D E F G. It's not Z; it's Z. I love it. Yeah. I love I started it. hearing that. I was like, what's with this Zed thing? <laughs> Sometimes I call Zachary Z. That's my youngest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's 23 months, I think. You can tell he's my second because I don't know <laughs> yeah. how old he is. Uh, yeah. But yeah, maybe I'll start calling him Zed for a nickname. That's kind of cool. I like that. So like Chris was saying, it can be uh, they can be found at www.f.org.nz. Zed. Yes. Hey, you're becoming a Kiwi. Awesome. I, trust me. Yeah. After learning about what New Zealand does for conservation, I yeah. think I I want to become an honorary Kiwi myself. Yeah. It's, they it's they are leading honor. the way, but awesome. But with that being said, the, um, the World Wildlife Fund of New Zealand, they have a great Facebook presence and they are also trailblazers charging the way, not only for Kiwis, but for tons of wildlife in uh, in New Zealand. And of course, in general, the World Wildlife Fund, their mission is to protect nature and take care of the planet. And they do a great job of that. In general, they look after oceans, they tackle climate change, they work locally with community conservation, environmental education, they protect native species, and of course, will even do community funding and fundraising. The main reason why I selected them this week is because of their focus on New Zealand's terrestrial habitats and species, which predominantly influence, in a positive way, the Kiwi survival rates. We all know that New Zealand's home to an extraordinary high proportion of plants, animals, habitats, and ecosystems that occur nowhere else on Earth, right? Especially the Kiwi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And many of these are in the state of the decline. So it was news to me in... Maybe you covered this somewhere, but New Zealand has one of the highest rates of threatened native species of any country in the world. Yeah. No, I didn't cover it, but it's true. Yeah, it's true. So the World Wildlife Fund of New Zealand, their aim by 2025 with priority species such as the kiwi and the habitats and places that these priority species live in is to stabilize and to recover them. Um, and they're committed to helping the communities around them recognize that and get that done. And with that being said, right. the New Zealanders have been inspired and able to take more action and care of the habitats and therefore the species that inhabit them. And lastly, they have priority species and habitats where the Kiwis live that include the Northland region uh, and also some on the South Island. So they're covering both islands. And so, right. yeah, yeah, I just want to give them a shout out mm -hmm. and go mm -hmm. check out their webpage, especially if you're from New Zealand or if you were just curious like me. And I just, I know the group, the World Wildlife Fund does a lot and on many different continents and in many different countries. I just have to give a shout out to New Zealand World Wildlife Fund for all the work they've done with terrestrial habitats 
and the endangered species or vulnerable species that inhabit them, like the kiwi. Yeah, no, no, they it's, uh, a lot of people, and it's just great to to hear about those organizations. And I, I know this was a long one, folks, but again, I just I think New Zealand we are learning so much about ecology and conservation. So this one ran a little bit long, and obviously my enthusiasm, and I like to share all this knowledge, and I'll keep doing it. I'll keep doing it. And he's gonna sing the Conser- anthem soon, folks. He's gonna sing it for us. <laughs> God, I'm well, holding him to God it. God save. Uh, okay. So conservation tips. I really, you know, it's a big thing here when you go to New, come to New Zealand is become an eco traveler. And th- that means a lot of different things. Clearing customs in New Zealand is very rigorous because we're trying to keep out invasive species. There was a good radio lab. It was the one on the Galapagos Islands. If you're really into ecology conservation, I heavily suggest that episode. They talk about They have all these invasive plants because people are bringing in plant seeds on your shoes, your pants, your socks. You don't realize they're there. And then you go trekking or hiking and these seeds drop off. And now all of a sudden you have an invasive plant where they don't belong. So when you come to New Zealand, like especially if you bring any camping equipment, climbing equipment, stuff like that, they clean it for you. I mean, they're very thorough and it can become a nightmare. Did you have to go through a foot bath or anything? No, but Ashley did bring in some bee equipment, which you weren't supposed to, and we threw it out. Like, they threw it out. Her bee veil, which was worth, mm-hmm. like, a lot of money that she got from the UK. So I was like, Ashley, why'd you even bring that? You should have known better. And um, anyways, so clearing she's customs a rebel. is a rebel. That's why you love her. <laughs> she's she she's did, eating she was... that bagel as she's, like, dilated <laughs> yeah. four or five yeah. centimeters. Like, yeah, I'm going right. to teach this <laughs> hospital a lesson. <laughs> so whenever you travel... Please clean all your clothes, clean your shoes, everything, because you bring things with you. You never know what's on you. Uh, I'm going to put a link on how to be a responsible eco traveler. You know, flying is one of the the hugest hits. That's why my carbon imprint was so bad last year. Flying to New Zealand, you know, you're going to fly. You're going to travel. I you mean, have to it, right. It, it, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, look at the, you know, the, the cheapest way to get there or not the cheapest way. Well, that's what we do. But the most economical, you know, the shortest flights, pack lighter, heavier bags, take more fuel. It's like when we went to the moon, they had to plan it out to the ounce. Isn't that incredible? Ounce wow. Yeah. Because of the rocket fuel. I mean, and it's because that you traveling long distances, it can burn a lot more fuel. So, you know, pack lighter. And then wherever you go, think about planting a tree, something native, you know, or, or donating to a cause wherever you're going, you know, but, you know, come visit us here. It, it, New Zealand is amazing. It's a great place. Now, Angie, I've, I've caught you a couple of times in the podcast. I didn't want to correct you because it would give away okay. the question in the beginning. Yeah. The prop, the proper plural for Kiwi is drum roll Kiwi. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was it. not saying that. I was Ki- saying Kiwis for sure. Kiwis are the people of New Zealand. Ah, okay. okay. So plural of Kiwi is Kiwi. When you say Kiwis, you're talking about the people. And then when you're saying the fruit, you say Kiwi fruit. Then you're talking about the Chinese. So if I had like 10 Kiwi fruit, I would say I have 10 Kiwi fruits. Kiwi fruit. Or it wouldn't be plural. Yeah. Yeah, or, or I, yeah, stumped I, have ten, I have 10 I of these kiwi you. fruits. Yeah. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> kiwi is kiwi. There you go. <laughs> so, all right. You know, if you can follow us on Patreon, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I ask you to share, please, please, please do this on Facebook, on social media. Share one up, ep- share this episode or your favorite episode with mother, brother, sister, spouse, anybody, your partner, whoever it is. Please share one of our episodes and say, everybody hey, knows somebody that likes animals, right? So yeah, yeah, please share. Get them hooked. Get them hooked. You know, it keeps me and Angie going, keeps this enthusiasm going. I'm going to bring another New Zealand animal here in the next year. I promise. I've got some awesome. lined up. So Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, thank you for this uh Chris. Your your enthusiasm has been has been contagious. So, I loved it. <laughs> good, I loved good. it. They're and amazing. it's a fun They're bird. Amazing. Like I mean, I honestly yeah. knew you were excited to do this, but it wasn't until I started really researching it and seeing mm-hmm. the cool physiological adaptions yeah. and yeah. The brown long feathers that look make it look shaggy. Uh, I fell in yeah. love for sure. Like I said, I'm hopefully oh, hopefully your country will accept me as an honorary kiwi as well. Yes, please, please <laughs> come down. I'll, we got to get John a, a, a zoo job around here, and me and you will 
We'll just do our pod from New Zealand. I love it. <laughs> I love it. All right. All right. Cheers, mate. I will uh, talk to you in a few days. Okay. Sounds good. How do you say goodbye in uh, Kiwi language? We say, we say cheers. Okay. Um, sweet is used quite a bit. Like, oh, that's sweet. Okay. And brilliant to an extent. Okay. But cheers. You know, cheers is usually the one. Okay. So, so cheers, well, mate. Instead of, everybody's your instead mate. Instead of good night, cheers, mate, Chris. Does that sound good? <laughs> All right, Angie. Take care. Right. I will talk to you. Talk I'll say bye bye. That's my Midwestern way to do it. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Listen, learn, share. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.